Hello, my name is Caleb Rumet, and I am a sophomore studying chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Kenneth Hayes, who is a professor of physics and the chair of the physics department here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Hayes earned his BS from the University of California, Davis in 1975, and his PhD at Stanford University in 1980, and then he worked for nine years as a research scientist in particle physics at CERN in Switzerland and SLAC, which is the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. He started teaching at Hillsdale in 1989. He's one of the most recognizable professors on campus and one of the most enthusiastic prof professors I have ever had and takes a personal interest in the subject matter and material and challenges students to fundamentally understand physics concepts. Dr. Hayes also takes a special interest in topics regarding climate change and his talk tonight will cover the physics of the greenhouse effect. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Um, sorry for the delay, but we're recording this, and we discovered that the best way to do the sound is like this, particularly when I turn and look at the slides. Um, the, the volume and the other mics went really bad, so we're giving this a try. But um, thank you all for coming. Um, I've been working on climate change for about 15 years, and in the last few months, there's been a real resurgence, a real growth, a kind of an awakening of awareness of the problem. And there's some reasons for it, and I'll um, discuss those in a couple of minutes. And I just decided, well, this is the, this is the time to do this. So um, there's gonna be three, like, well, let me first get off this. This is a, a little carbon clock that um, takes our carbon budget that we have if we don't want to exceed one and a half degrees C, which is 374 billion tons. And right now we're using up, we're emitting CO2 in the atmosphere at, at 1,331 tons a second. And so we're gonna burn up our budget in eight years and 10 months and 27 days. And so you can just sit there and watch it go down. If you wanna move to the two degree scenario, you can do that. And that'll tell you the budget um, to when we, ex when we uh, will cross two degrees. But um, let's. I've actually never gotten out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it may be a challenge to get out of it. There we go. So I'm gonna be giving three talks. Um, tonight's basically gonna be on the physics of the greenhouse effect, what determines planet temperatures. And um, a week from now, I'll talk about um, the impacts of climate change, of which there are many, and there's an awful lot of data about that. And then two weeks from tonight, I'm going to talk about what can we do, okay? Um, my goal is to show you enough physics and data that you don't have to rely on an authority, that you can rely on your own understanding of what's going on. And so that, that's, my, that's my goal. I want to thank Caleb, and I want to thank uh, Philip for running the recording. Um, if it all works out, we'll put it up on YouTube. Um, why should you pay any attention to me? I'm not a climate scientist, um, but I am a physicist, and the problem is a physics problem. What determines the temperature of the Earth, and is the Earth's temperature changing, and why is it changing, and how rapidly is it changing? That's a physics problem. And I've done physics for 40 years. Um, my specialty is data analysis. I have a passion to uh, analyze data, and so I, I've been become fascinated by the phenomenal amount of data on the climate that's available. Um, studying climate change and reflecting on its impact on humanity, on humanity is the most interesting academic work I've ever done. And um, I usually don't, well, I, I looked at, look not so well on people who beat their own drums, but uh, I really want you to hear me. 
And so I'm beating my, my drum a little bit. Uh, please don't look badly on that. I'm just trying to show you my credentials. If you were going to go to a doctor, you want the doctor to have all the credentials on the wall so you can trust them. So um, here's an example of some work I did. But right before I came to Hillsdale, a statistical study of uh, tau um, decay. And um, I'm a member of the, I was a member of the particle data group for 34 years. We publish every two years the review of particle physics, and it's a summary of all of particle physics, and it's based on statistical analysis. So I've done lots and lots of statistical analysis. That's a paper I published with Martin Pearl, my advisor, and he won the Nobel Prize in physics, and I'm very, very grateful to him because he gave me my professional career. So here's the first paper um, in climate physics that caught my attention. This is a paper from 1998 by uh, Henry Pollack and a couple of other fellows from the University of Michigan. And I read this paper and I thought, wow, this is, this is really, really interesting. And what they did was they reconstructed the last 500 years of the Earth's temperature history by measuring temperatures, present day temperatures. It turns out that the ground stores a history of the temperature at the surface of the ground because heat travels so slowly through the ground. And so if you drill down a couple hundred meters, drill a borehole, and then you wait a little while for the heat from your drilling to go away, and then you measure the temperature profile of the borehole, you can reconstruct the temperature history at the top of the borehole for about 500 years. And so that's what these guys did. They did it all over the surface of the Earth. And here's their, uh, whoops, their major data. So this is what they published in that paper. This is year, um, 1500 to about 2000. And this shows the average temperature that they reconstructed by making those borehole measurements all over the Earth's surface, um, how it differs from the present temperature. So here in the year 2000, that would be the present temperature. And so the difference from the present temperature from the present temperature would be zero. And they saw that about 1,500 years ago, it was about a degree cooler on the planet. And if you look at how the temperature increased as you go through the centuries, it's just been accelerating. And if you say, uh, well, we're going to see that um, the prediction for, for our current century is such that the line becomes vastly steeper in, in, our, current, in our current century. So that very much impressed me. And um, being an experimental physicist, I decided to drill my own borehole and see what I could learn from it. So this is a borehole I put in the ground about 10 years ago in my backyard. And I instrumented it with thermometers. It happened to be a political campaign going on when I took the picture. <laughs> so anybody who's old enough to remember that particular political campaign can date the picture. But uh, the electronics is under that can, and it's painted white so that the sun doesn't get it too hot and protects it from the weather. And uh, here's an example of the, the data I got from that borehole. So this is um, just the temperature uh, 10 centimeters above the surface um, for days starting after July 1st, 2009, which is when I started it. So this is about a week of data from that borehole. It had one temperature probe 10 centimeters up, measuring the air temperature. And then it had three temperature probes buried in the borehole, one 10 centimeters down and one 30 centimeters down and one 70 centimeters down. And so this curve that varies so much, that's the temperature right at the surface over that week. You can see it's in degrees C, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. And there wasn't much weather that week. So the pattern repeats every day. You can see the sun rises right here. This is when the sun rises. You can go look up the time of sunrise and check when the temperature 10 centimeters above the surface starts to rise. And that's right then at sunrise. And it goes up pretty rapidly. And then during the course of the day, it fluctuates a little. And then when the sun sets, it starts to fall. And that's, that falling is due to the surface of the ground radiating away the energy that it picked up during the day. So in fact, the two physical processes that determine the temperature of the planet are, are here shown in this graph. This is the energy coming from the sun heating it. And then this is the radiant energy leaving the surface, cooling it. Sun comes back up, and that process repeats. You can see that 
from day to day, the temperature wasn't exactly the same. It was a little bit cooler here, a little bit warmer there. If you look down into the ground, you see that the, it takes time for the heat information on the surface to propagate down into the ground. So here at 10 centimeters down, that's, that's the graph in 10 centimeters down. You see that it peaks later than the daytime air temperature peaks. And if you go 30 centimeters down, it peaks later still. And so that's just the time it takes for the heat to propagate. So that's how these guys were able to reconstruct the temperature by using boreholes that only had to go a couple hundred meters deep. If you look 70 centimeters down, you can no longer see the day-night day variations in the temperature. And you can see that the, that temperature was dropping for a few days, and that was coming from the cold air that was here. It took a few days for that cold air here to get recorded 77 centimeters down in the ground. So that's the basic physics. It's just diffusion of heat. And that's why that article that those guys wrote so impressed me. Because it seemed to me a really subtle issue that, yeah, we have really started heating the planet. So um, you can look at a lot of other things with that data. Um, let's see what's happening. Learning how to use this stuff. There we go. So this is um, 70 weeks of the air surface temperature um, starting from July 1st, 2009. And this is the whole cycle, so you have 24-hour cycles and everything else. And what you have here is, um, this is climate, okay? That's climate. This isn't quite the weather in the sense this is day-night variations here. You can see that the summer was a little warmer in 2010 than it was in 29. And that little curve I've drawn there is just a sine function to show you roughly what the average of the weather is. Um, now, you can, if you average over 24 hours, then you can get rid of that day-night variation, and then this really shows the weather. So this is the weather in Hillsdale, Michigan, um, for about 70 weeks, starting from July 1st. And you can see all the storms that came in. You can see the cold weather and the warm weather. And um, that's the difference between weather and climate. Now, I did that for three years until I read a paper. And the paper said, if I wanted to measure a trend like the heating at Hillsdale, Michigan, in my, at the surface of my borehole, I would need to take data for 30 years to get just the sign of the trend, whether it was positive or negative, whether it's warming or cooling, uh, precise. That is, to know it precisely, it would take 30 years. And when I read that paper and saw their, their uh, simulations, I said, that's enough for me, and I, <laughs> and I stopped doing it. Um, if you look at the ground uh, temperatures, this is kind of interesting. You can see that uh, this ground got covered in snow, and so the fluctuations in the ground stopped getting passed through the snow act like a blanket, so you don't see the fluctuations in the ground temperatures much. This is before the snow cover came. And then right here on one day in March, there was enough heat from the sun to melt the ice that was left uh, in, the, in the ground, and the ground became very moist, and the heat flowed rapidly, and the thawed out, and you could say that was the first day of spring. So that's kind of fun. There's all this stuff that you can get out of data sets like this. Now, well, I'm giving these three lectures right now because of this awakening that I mentioned. And the awakening is due to several things. One thing is that there was three really significant reports that were published in the last year and a half. The first one was something called the U.S. Fourth, Na Fourth National Climate Assessment. And um, that um, was on, on the science of climate change. And um, that was published in October of 2017. The second one was published in November of 2018. It was volume two of the Fourth National Climate Assessment. And that was on the risks and that adaptation just in the United States. The third significant report was uh, when the Paris Climate Agreement was passed in, or uh, ratified by 196 countries in the world back in 2015. I don't know if you remember, but they kind of had a target to keep the temperature increase below two, but try to keep it as close to one and a half degrees as you could manage. And so they had a report done to see what's the difference in the consequences of keeping the temperature at one and a half degrees versus two. And that report was published in 
October of 2018. Uh, the authors have all started using more emphatic language to kind of get people's attention. They're pretty hard to read. Okay, these reports are hard to read. They're written by scientists, for scientists. Um, they have these things called the executive summaries for policymakers. But here's just an example. And when I read this, this particular page had a really significant impact on me. So this is from page 17 of volume one of the National Climate Assessment. And if you just read that first sentence up there, and I'm really having trouble remembering between my laser pointer and, and this, it says annual average temperature over the contiguous United States has increased by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius for the period 1901 through 2016, and is projected to continue to rise. Now they say that with very high confidence. So they, they put all their statements with confidence ratings so you know how much to trust it. And well, we all knew that, but this next, the second paragraph down here said something that really I kind of knew, but I was impressed that it would be said so directly in a report. And basically in the second paragraph, they say that in all emission scenarios that they imagine, that they consider, in all RCP, um, representative concentration pathways, a really fancy bureaucratic term for how much CO2 they imagine we'll emit into the atmosphere, for all the ones that they imagine, and they typically imagine three, one that's business as usual, if we don't do anything, that's called business as usual, and then one where we work really, really hard to cut it back, and then one that's about halfway between. They said for all of those, they expect these large increases in temperature in the United States. So I've kind of summarized what that they said. Temperature increase in the United States from 1990 to 2050 will be about 1.4 degrees C. At least that in all the emission scenarios they considered. And when I read that, I was just like, wow, look at these guys. Look what they're saying. You know what that means? That means there's no way we're going to meet the two degree Paris climate agreement. We're going to go way beyond that in all emission scenarios. So that was pretty amazing. Here's another one. Um, maybe if I'm pointed over here. There we go. Oh, that's just a page they have that tells you how to interpret their fancy language. The confidence level being very high or high or medium or low or whatever. Um, well, here you can look at the data. So I'm going to show you the data. This is data. Um, this is very recent data. For example, 2018, the average temperature, the Earth temperature in 2018 is right there. That point's just a week or so old. And this shows the temperature of the surface of the planet averaged over the surface from 1850 to basically this past year, 2018, um, from a group of people who originally, the, uh, the guy who ran this group, he was a climate denier. And he got money from the Koch brothers to do the data analysis himself. So he would find what was wrong with all the people who did the data analysis before him. And it turns out he got the same answer as everybody else. They call themselves the Berkeley Earth um, group. And, and so it's nice to use them because um, after they had done their analysis, they published the New York Times and said, yep, it's heating just like everybody said. And yep, it's caused by us, which was just terrific. So they have this graph and you can see Here's a temperature increase from 1850 to 1900, and we're expected to cross one and a half degrees in uh, around 2040, and we're gonna cross two degrees a little bit after 2060. And the, the rise in temperatures, this is data, this is not any climate model, this is data, is uh, really, really clear. So this is, from the IPCC report, and this graph has appeared all, all over the media and all kinds of newspapers and shows, um, which tells us how we have to cut back our emissions, our CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels, if we want to keep the, the temperature from rising no more by one, than one and a half degrees. And here's the total, total emissions on the planet and billions of tons of CO2 per year. This is roughly what we've been doing from like 1960 on to the present time. So we're up at about 45 billion tons of CO2 per year. And we just basically have to cut it down to zero by either 2040 or 2055, depending on what else we do that affects the, the temperature, like how we handle land uses and so on. 
And that's roughly about 10% per year, starting right now. That is, we don't want the planet's temperature to rise above one and a half degrees. We have to start cutting back 10% per year right now. And that's got a lot of press, um, as it should have gotten a lot of press. I should note that we apparently cut back by 1% during the recession in 2008, 2009. The recession had an impact of 1% on our emissions. And here, if we want to keep the temperature from going above one and a half, we've got to cut back 10% each year. It's not going to happen. And this, is, this is not going to happen. Um, so people have gotten um, kind of riled up by this, which is appropriate. I think they, they should. And there's been, well, for, there's another reason that uh, people are paying more attention. And for example, here's the 10 most expensive climate change related disasters in 2018. This is just last year. 10 most expensive. Top of the list are hurricanes Florence and Michael. They were $17 billion roughly and $15 billion loss. All this government shutdown and all the trouble over President Trump's border wall is $5.7 billion, right? Each of these hurricanes were three times the loss of the price of the, of the border wall. So these are big numbers. If you add up the top 10, it's $85 billion just last year. I think this played a big role in the awakening. The fact that there were these incredible images coming out of California uh, in the fall, showing uh, burning both in Northern California and Paradise, California. What an ironic name, Paradise, California. Here's four pictures of um, a burned out neighborhood. You've all seen these. The aluminum block of a car that melted. Um, this is the Wolsey Fire in California. This is people trying to get out of Malibu on November 9th. So you look at Highway 1 and the, all the cars exiting Malibu. And that picture, I don't know about you, but it just, that's a very powerful image. Well, I don't know what you want your apocalypse to look like, but, but that's, that's a pretty powerful image. So towns have started to declare climate emergencies. This is a really excellent idea. It's, and here's a list of 40 towns around the, around the world. There's been four countries so far, Australia, United States, Canada, and UK, that have declared climate emergencies. And these are more than just making a statement. We believe that we have an emergency with regards to the climate. They actually include in most of their declarations ideas about what they can do in their own community to help improve things. So I've read uh, half a dozen of them or so, and it's um, pretty nice. Here's a graph that shows how many towns have declared climate emergencies starting from the first one in December 2016. The first town to declare a climate emergency was in Australia, Darwin City, has a population of 159,000 people. Here's January 17, so this is 2017, here's 2018. And if you look in January 2019, this past January, there's 14 towns around the world that have declared climate emergency. And in the previous month, there was uh, nine. So that growth looks exponential to me, and that's how I can justify that statement, that we are in a time of increased awareness of the climate problem. OK, so that's why I decided to give these talks. And there's going to be three of them. First one is technical. It's on physics. I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can, but not simpler. So you can understand what determines the planet temperature. Okay? Then next week, it's going to be on the impacts of increasing temperature on the planet. And in two weeks, as I said, what we might do. So we were, um, this, is, this, this image, has, this, this idea has always really impressed me. And that is, here we are the beautiful Earth, and our nearest neighbors have very different climate climates. Mars basically has a very thin atmosphere, mostly carbon dioxide, and, and you can almost imagine it doesn't have any atmosphere at all. On the other side, we got Venus, and Venus has what's called the runaway greenhouse effect. Its atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, and we'll see in a couple of minutes just how extreme that is. And it just 
never ceases to amaze me that in our own solar system, we have examples on either side of the effects of the atmosphere on the climate. One, no atmosphere, and the other, runaway greenhouse effect. So this slide here contains basically the whole story about what determines the planet's temperature. Right? We're going to see it in a little bit more detail, but this is the whole story. You have the sun, and in the center of the sun, there's nuclear reactions. You're basically taking energy by combining hydrogen and forming helium. And so there's a lot of energy produced there in the core of the sun. And it takes something like 100,000 years for that energy to propagate to the surface. And once that energy propagates to the surface, it leaves the surface by the only way it can, which is by light, by, by radiation that travels at the speed of light. So it takes about eight minutes to reach the Earth. So you can think, wow, it's very different between traveling from the center of the sun to the surface 100,000 years and from the surface of the sun to the Earth eight minutes. And so the Earth is getting a blast of that energy all the time. And that's, if that was the whole story, the Earth's temperature would just rise, would continuously rise. If you get more energy from the sun, the temperature would rise. But the Earth emits its own light, its own radiation, and that's called what's in the infrared band. It's thermal radiation. This is all thermal radiation. And that tends to cool a planet. So remember when I showed you the 24-hour period at Hillsdale, Michigan, and when the sun went down, the ground cooled? That was because the ground was emitting radiation out into space. And that took energy from the surface of the ground and cooled the ground. And then the sun came, started taking the energy from you know, hitting the ground from the, from the sun, and that would raise the temperature. So what happens is normally there's a balance. There's a balance so that the energy that the Earth gets on average coming in from the sun is balanced by the energy it radiates away um, into, into space, and then the temperature of the Earth would stay on average constant. If, you, if that balance gets screwed up, for example, it has gotten screwed up in that we have put a blanket around the Earth, and we've made it harder for the radiation to exit the ground and get back into space. It's now harder. And so the temperature of the Earth is rising as we're not getting rid of as much energy as we should, so the temperature is rising. And as the temperature rises, the amount of energy we radiate out into space will increase. And eventually, if we stopped changing the atmosphere, if we didn't put any more blanket on it, it would come into balance again at a higher temperature. So that's the physics of what's happening right there. Now, I'd be happy to take questions, except we're on a clock, a very strict clock, and I'll take questions afterwards. So if you have questions, just remember them and then ask me, okay? And you can come up and ask me personally. You can email me. I want to answer everybody's questions. Also, the, we're going to make the slides available to anybody who has access to Box. So if you just leave your name and your email there, I'll, I'll make the slides available to you. So we need to know a few properties of thermal radiation. I got some equations here. Don't worry about it. Most people, just, they just have a hard time with equations, and that's perfectly fine and perfectly understandable. So that's not the essence. If you do a, some, a bunch of students here understand the equations and you're happy with them, if you don't, don't let it bother you in the slightest. It's just the theory of thermal radiation was worked out by first by Max Planck. He did it in 1900, and he had to invent the fundamental idea of quantum mechanics to do it. But he, that's not our story tonight. He, just, he worked it out, and he's got a little equation there called Planck's equation. It tells you how much color of radiation you get from any object emitting because it has a temperature. All objects, because they have temperatures, emit. And that's the equation. There's another equation that tells you how much energy over all the different colors they emit. And that's this equation right here. And it's very important it grows like the fourth power of the temperature. So if I double the temperature, the amount of radiation emitted goes up like 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16 times. If I double the temperature, the amount of thermal radiation emitted goes up by 16 times. Um, so this is a graph that represents that equation. It's got the essence of that equation in this graph. On the vertical axis, it shows how much radiation is getting emitted per unit area, 
per little, per little width of color that you're talking about. And then this is the color on the horizontal axis. Um, the, the colors that your eyes are sensitive to are shown there by the rainbow. And over here, it's infrared. Your eye is not sensitive to these wavelengths, these colors, nor is your eye sensitive here to the ultraviolet. And there's four different curves, one for 3,000 degrees Kelvin, one for 4,000, one for 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000. The sun's temperature is 5,700 degrees. So the sun's radiation is, the, is between these two curves here. And you can see that if I double the temperature from 3,000 up to 6,000, there's way, way, way more energy emitted. Okay, that's that t to the fourth factor. So there's 16 times as much. And, it, and you go from being these longer wavelengths in the infrared to being more invisible. And if you can make it even hotter, it'll go into the ultraviolet. So let's use some examples. Let's use our skin. Okay? We use our skin. Now there's some, some numbers up here you don't have to pay attention to. If you, were, if you would pay attention to the formulas, here's the numbers you need to make the formulas you know, calculate things. But we're just interested in this answer right here. The total thermal power emitted by your skin, averaged over all of your skin, is about 920 watts. Just take these numbers here and stick them in the formulas that Mr. Planck gave us, and that'll give you 920 watts. That's about 484 watts per square meter of skin surface. And your skin has almost two square meters, hard to believe, but it does. And so you basically almost double that to get the total energy. Your body is providing the energy it needs to radiate away that, or else your skin would cool below the temperature it wants to be at, 920 watts. Now you're in a room, and everything in this room is emitting thermal radiation also. But the temperature of the room is a little lower than your skin. The temperature of the room is probably 22 degrees C, and the temperature of skin is around 34 degrees C. So you're absorbing the infrared radiation from all the walls in the room, and the floor, and the table, and the chairs. And you're absorbing about 820 watts. So you end up not having to provide 900 watts. That's about a hair dryer's worth of energy to keep your skin warm. You only have to supply 100 watts, because you're getting the rest from the room. Now, if we made the room go away, let's put you out in deep space, so you weren't absorbing infrared radiation from the room, your body would still have to supply 920 watts to keep your skin warm, and it couldn't do that. And you would freeze and die. So you're living in a sea of infrared radiation, and it's critical to our survival. Every single thing is emitting this radiation. Okay, in fact, the thermal radiation emitted from your skin accounts for two-thirds of your resting body energy consumption in cool, still air. It's a big deal. This isn't a tiny deal. This is a big deal. Infrared radiation is a big deal. And it, it ought to be taught very, very young so, so people understand it very, very early in their lives. So here's photographs. You get these cameras that can take photographs in infrared. Here's one right here. This is the one I've shown in that picture. It's a, a FLIR-1, and it um, will convert your iPhone. For 199 bucks, this will convert your iPhone into an infrared camera. And there's an example of a photograph taken with an iPhone. And there's that photograph there I took with this infrared camera um, back in 2014 of a class when we turned out all the lights. And we just looked at the radiation emitted by human bodies, my students, sitting in the room. And you can read the temperature. So for example, at the, at the core right there, the temperature right there was 28.6 degrees. If you know that formula, and you program that formula that Mr. Planck gave us in your infrared camera, you can calculate by measuring the infrared radiation what the temperature is. Um, here's some pictures. Just go to Google Images and type in infrared camera photos, and you get all kinds of cool photos where things are imaged in not visible light, but in infrared light. And they're really fun to look at. Um, for example, in that top photo up there, you're looking at a motor that's starting to die. It's hot right there. And so this is used a lot by people who are trying to maintain industrial equipment. And you can look at city scenes. You can look at how the temperature in your hand varies. And here's a picture of a dog taken with a, either a FLIR-1 or a competing camera. And you can see the scene in infrared. 
So let's look at the sun's emission now. Okay, we looked at the human skin. Let's look at the sun. So again, here's the numbers for the people who are paying attention to the numbers. Stick in the formula. Where your skin emitted 484 watts per meter squared, the sun emits 63 million watts per meter squared because the sun's temperature is 19 times your skin temperature. So you put 19 times 19 times 19 times 19 into that formula, and you can see, my goodness, the difference between my skin emitting thermal radiation and the sun is simply the fact that the sun is 19 times hotter than my skin, and that's what factor 19 will do when you take it to the fourth power, 63 million watts. If you add, the sun has a whole lot more surface area than you do, so you add up all the power emitted by the sun, and the total power emitted by the sun is that number there. So gigantic, it's just inconceivable how big that number is. And that compares to 920 watts for your skin. So now, we can use that idea of balancing the radiation emitted by a planet against the energy coming in from the sun, and just apply the equations a couple of times, and you get a very simple equation for what the temperature of a planet should be. Here's the equation for what the temperature of a planet should be. It depends on the temperature of the surface of the sun, 5,700 degrees. It depends on the radius of the sun. It tells you how much of the radiation the sun's actually putting out into space. It, tells, it depends on the distance from you and the sun, because as the sun, you get further from the sun, the intensity drops off. And then there's how much do you reflect off your surface, and then there's another factor, which is essentially one, don't worry about it. But so th there's an equation that'll tell you what the temperature of a planet should be. A simple equation. It's, you don't need a computer. You can just look at that equation, and you can calculate what the temperature of a planet should be. So, <laughs> comic relief. Here's a graph. So you take that equation, and you predict what the temperature of some planets, some objects in our solar system should be on the horizontal axis. And you take the measured temperature. You can measure it various ways. We've landed probes on, on uh, Mars and, and Venus. And, and you take that and you say, well, how do we do? On Mercury, that equation gives us pretty much exactly the measured temperature. That is the physics of what determines the planet's temperature with no atmosphere. That little formula, that's it. So there's Mercury, it works great. The Moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it works great. Mars essentially has no atmosphere, it works great. The Earth is a step above. Let's see how much it is. It's about 30 degrees C, roughly one third of those divisions higher than our prediction. And that's due to the greenhouse effect. That's due to our atmosphere. And Venus is way high compared to that prediction, and that's because of Venus's atmosphere, the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. So we understand what determines the temperatures of a planet with no atmosphere. Let's see what determines the temperature of a planet with an atmosphere. So let's look at the numbers for Earth now. We've looked at the numbers for our skin. We've looked at the numbers for the sun. Let's look at the numbers for the Earth. So the numbers for the Earth for this. The equation predicts that we would have 237 watts per meter squared emitted on the average from the Earth's, Earth's, the Earth's surface. 237 watts per meter squared. In fact, we have 386 watts per meter squared emitted from the Earth's surface. It's bigger than the equation by 63%. That's huge. That's the greenhouse effect. That's the atmosphere sending some of that infrared radiation back down to the Earth, and then the Earth tries to get rid of it, and that effect is 63%. Remember, the power emitted per unit area for your skin is 484 watts, so the Earth is emitting a little bit less than your skin, 386. So the whole surface of the Earth is emitting infrared radiation just like your skin is, and that's what cools the Earth. That's what caused that cooling on that first slide from my own little borehole, you could see that cooling. That's just that number right there. OK. So what about the numbers for Venus? Well, Venus is really interesting because Venus reflects, due to a little bit of sulfur dioxide in its atmosphere, three quarters of the light that hits Venus. Three quarters. Is, that's why Venus is so bright. Because three quarters of the light that reflect, 
reflects off, off Venus, Venus's atmosphere. We didn't talk about that number, it was in the equation, but I'm just saving time. If we use a predicted surface temperature of Venus, we get minus 31 degrees C. Um, and the measured average surface temperature, whoops, the measured average surface temperature of Venus is 464 degrees C, 867 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a phenomenal difference between the predicted from our formula and the actual temperature, almost 500 degrees C, almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the greenhouse effect on Venus. That's what the effect of the atmosphere can be on Venus. So you predict that Venus surface would be emitting 194 watts per square meter. Your skin is doing 484. The actual is 16,700 watts. The greenhouse effect on Venus is a factor of 86 times. That's what we have to make sure doesn't happen to our planet. Now, we can demonstrate this. I'm going to demonstrate how the greenhouse effect works with right here on the table. This is a simple way you can do it yourself. You can buy these um, very thin blankets or luminized mylar, and they're sold for a couple bucks as a protective blanket in case you need to protect yourself from a fire or freezing or something. And all you do is you put it over your head, and you can feel the infrared radiation coming off your face, reflecting off this and going back to your skin. Your skin is very sensitive. You can feel that. You can feel it get warm right away. So that's, that's Christos um, doing that. You can tell by his t-shirt. Um, so here's basically what happens. The atmosphere acts like a blanket, takes that infrared radiation that's coming off the surface, whoops, and reflects about half of it back down. It absorbs it, and then it re-emits it. And the deal is that it remits it in all directions. So half of it ends up going up, and half of it goes back down to the surface. It's just what a blanket does. And that heats the planet. So the atmosphere of the Earth, here's a table with all the numbers. It turns out 99% of the atmosphere is oxygen and nitrogen. They don't reflect. They don't absorb the infrared. They don't. They just let it go right through. It's like they're not even there. There's only trace gases that actually can interact, absorb that infrared energy from the Earth's surface and send it back down. And CO2 is one of them, and water is one of them. And you can see it's due to the structure of the molecule. Nitrogen and oxygen are two, two, two atoms joined together in a molecule. But, uh, but uh, water and CO2 has three. And because they have three, they can vibrate a lot many different ways than, than these two can, and they happen to vibrate at just the right frequencies that they can absorb that radiation coming off the surface, send half of it on up and half of it on back, down. If you look um, for the composition of Venus, Venus is 96.5% CO2. So that runaway greenhouse effect on Venus is caused by the fact that it's, it's almost all CO2. This sulfur dioxide that makes it bright and, and reflects three quarters of the sun's light it hits Venus is only 150 parts per million. So that's how trace gases can have such a huge effect on the Earth's temperature. The fraction of, of uh, the atmosphere, the CO2, is 410 parts per million. 400, right now, 410 parts per million. That's 0.041%. That's the fraction of CO2, and the fraction of methane is this, 1.79 parts per million. Methane's way better at reflecting the infrared radiation than CO2 is, but there's a lot less of it, so CO2 wins out. If you gathered all the molecules of CO2 in the atmosphere and you put them in a layer right here, you just gather them all down and put them in a layer at the same temperature and pressure, the CO2 would only be three and a half meters thick. That's not quite the distance to the, that's not quite the, distance to the ceiling. So all the CO2 in our atmosphere would just be the gas, not quite the distance to the ceiling. And the, the, the methane would only be 1.6 centimeters thick. These are trace gases, and yet they're the reason the Earth isn't frozen solid, is these gases. So our problem is that we've been adding CO2 to the atmosphere. That's our problem. So I want to demonstrate to you um, that. <clears throat> 
the first guy to calculate this, he's calculated in 1986. This is this guy, Cervantes Arrhenius, and he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1903. Um, it's kind of a co co complicated calculation, and I've tried to follow it myself, and it's a lot of work. So I hunted for a simple way. So here's a simple way. Saves you from having to do all that calculations. I got a demonstration here that's going to simulate the absorption of infrared radiation in CO2. This is going to hold CO2, 10 centimeter thick layer of CO2. Remember that the atmosphere has three and a half meters of CO2 in it. So if you took 35 of these things and stacked them one on top of each other, you'd have the atmosphere. And I'm going to simulate the Earth's surface by this piece of metal. I'm going to heat it. I originally tried to, this is a, a third generation of this experiment. I tried in earlier generations to actually use light to heat it, so be a little bit closer to, to the way it works on the Earth. But it turns out that it's real hard to know exactly how much light energy you're, you're putting into this square. And it's much easier to just use an electric heater. So I have an electric heater, and I'm going to heat this thing up. And I've got it insulated on five sides, so the heat won't go out. The heat will just come up, and most of it will come up as infrared radiation. And then we'll take this 10 centimeters first with air, and then we'll fill this with CO2, and we'll watch as the CO2 reflects half of the radiation back down, or some fraction of the radiation back down. Half of it goes down, half of it goes up, and of the part that it reflects. And we'll measure the temperature of this plate. So we'll put a temperature probe in here and measure the temperature of the plate, and we'll see that the CO2 actually does raise the temperature. So this is supposed to represent the Earth's surface, and this will represent the CO2 in the atmosphere. And we'll see for ourselves what 10 centimeters of CO2 will do. Now, I'm going to um, first do it with blankets, all right? I'm going to do the demonstration first with blankets because I actually considered doing it with blankets on my bed and measuring how my temperature increased as I put more and more blankets. And I decided pretty soon that was a stupid idea. <laughs> and so we're going to measure the temperature, and then we're going to put a blanket on, and we're going to see what happens. It's going to go up. Temperature's going to go up. Because same reason it goes up for you. When you put a blanket over yourself in bed, it's going to go up. And then we're going to say, well, what happens if I had another blanket? It's going to go up some more. And what happens if I had another blanket? It's going to go up some more. So I'm going to show you that first with blankets. And I have 30 blankets. Because remember, it would take 35 of these to equal all the CO2 in the atmosphere. And I ain't going to build 35 of those and stack them all up. But I can get you the sense that adding another one would increase the temperature more than one by doing it with the blankets. So we're going to do that. Here's what you get. Um, let's see, I adjust the temperature. The, I adjust the power going into the Earth's surface. So in the case of blankets, it's only 81 watts per meter squared, not the 484 of your skin, but only 81. That's because the temperature gets so high, it would, it would do damage to my apparatus. And so uh, here's what you see. So there's, you have to hold the blankets down to keep heat from escaping on the side. There's the infrared camera picture of the plate when it's warm. So. You can see the plate's 30.7 degrees, and we're now going to put a blanket over it and watch the temperature rise. So I see it's got that little screen up there, which wants it to go away. There we go. So here's the data. Uh, oh, the number of blankets um, from zero to 30. And here's how much the plate's temperature was above the room temperature as I added more blankets. So when I had no blankets at all, the plate was about, with that amount of power going into the heater, was about 9 degrees C. And if I added more and more blankets, it just got hotter and hotter. And eventually I got it to like almost 60 degrees C hotter than the room temperature by adding 30 blankets. Now, um, if, here's how the data actually looked when I went from three to four to five blankets. And 
this took a long time. Okay, this data run here, it started, I started showing on this graph at 190 hours into the run, and there's 200 hours into the run, and there's 210 hours into the run. It took a long time for the temperatures to equilibrate, but here's what you see what happens. So here it, I've got three blankets on, and it's some temperature of 52 and a half degrees, and then I add the fourth blanket. And I made it harder for the radiation to get out by putting the fourth blanket on. I made it harder. So what happens? Now there's more energy coming in from the heater than it's getting out at the top of the blankets. So the temperature starts rising. But as the temperature rises, it, it, it gets more intense. The infrared radiation and the convection coming up through the blankets gets stronger. And so eventually a new balance is established at a hotter plate temperature. Now there's much heater energy going in is equal to the amount leaving at the top of the blanket. And then I add another blanket and the whole thing just repeats. So the temperatures will change as long as the energy coming in from the heater is out of balance with how much is getting off the top of the stack. But as soon as they're in balance again, the temperature stays constant. That's exactly what's happening to the Earth. So now let's do it with CO2. So I'm going to replace the blankets with just one of these. I'm going to space it off a little bit. I have these thin plastic layers that trap the CO2, but they let the infrared radiation go through just fine. And I cover this with a plastic layer. I space it off by a little bit. And then I turn the whole thing upside down to get rid of convection. So the whole thing is turned upside down. It's all done upside down. You start with air in there. And then we blow the air out and replace it with CO2. It takes about one minute to put in CO2 and have the air leave. And we watch the temperature of the plate. So here's the data. Again, this took a long time. There's six hours, 36 hours. So here was the steady state temperature of the plate when I had air in the gas cell. And then I just add 10 centimeters of CO2. And what happens? Well, that starts sending some of the IR radiation back down, hits the surface of the plate, warms the surface of the plate, and the plate temperature went up by about one degree C. For 10 centimeters of CO2, the temperature went up by about one degree C. And then it turns out this stuff is semi-permeable to CO2. So over the course of a day, the CO2 leaks out and it gets replaced with air. And so that's why the temperature drops. Somebody went in the lab room and opened the door. And that's that little blip. And then I blew out the CO2 with argon because I'd read that you can fake yourself out in these demos by the convective properties of CO2, not the radiative properties, not the infrared reflection properties, but just the convective properties, how it carries heat. But argon has the same convective properties essentially as CO2. So if you flush it with argon, you can see if you're sensitive to convective properties or the radiative properties. In the previous apparatus I built, you got the same result with argon as you did with CO2. So that apparatus was sensitive to convective properties. And so the next generation, we solved that problem. Most demonstrations you see of this are not right. Most of them are responding to the convective properties, not the radiative properties of CO2. And all you have to do is try it out with argon and see that it doesn't do it. And then I did it again to make sure I got the same results. So if one of these things raises the temperature by a degree, one would guess that 30 of them would raise it roughly by 30 degrees, and the atmosphere raises the Earth's surface temperature on average by 33 degrees C. So you don't need to do those complicated calculations that Arrhenius did in 1896. You just see it. So here's a summary. The planet temperature is determined by thermal radiation received by the sun and emitted in space. For planets without atmospheres, the planet temperatures can be calculated from a simple formula. For planets with atmospheres, the greenhouse gases increase surface temperatures by redirecting the IR back towards the surface. The effect keeps the Earth warmer than what it would be without the greenhouse effect by 33 degrees C or 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which keeps the Earth from being a frozen ball. So we're, we're desperately dependent on the greenhouse effect. So we know the answer to the question, what's causing the Earth to warm? And we can, rewrite, we can change the question. Are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increasing? And if so, are human activities the cause? So the guy who answered that question definitively was a guy named Charles Keeling, who started precisely measuring 
the CO2 in the atmosphere in 1958 in a mountain in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. He chose that place because there was breezes over the Pacific Ocean. He wouldn't have his data biased by local CO2 emissions from uh, towns or cars or whatever. And here's the data as of uh, a couple of days ago. So this includes the data through January 2019. This is the most famous graph in science. If you go on Google Images and you type in the most famous graph in science, this will come up usually as the top graph in Google Images. The CO2 in the atmosphere, and back when he started in 1958, the CO2 was about 315 parts per million. And right now we're just passing 410, 410 parts per million. This cycle is the planet taking CO2 in when it grows plants in the spring. The plants take CO2 in and, and build their leaves and their trunks and so on. And then in the fall, when they decay and all the leaves fall off and the plants and all the green decays in the northern hemisphere, it re releases CO2. So that's the planet breathing over a cycle. And you can see that we're emitting in about three years' time as much as the planet is breathing in between spring and fall. We're emitting that amount in about three years' time. That is, we increase it in about three years compared to that one cycle of uh, summer winter. So if you think you're going to solve the problem by growing stuff, you're not. You can't possibly grow enough stuff to solve the problem. You can just tell by this graph that any scheme to solve the problem by growing stuff ain't going to work. That tells you how much, how massively we're emitting CO2 in the atmosphere. We're emitting 100,000 pounds per house in Hillsdale. 100,000 pounds per year per house in Hillsdale is how much we're emitting into the atmosphere. And it's changing the chemistry. We've changed the chemistry 46% compared to what it was before we started burning coal around 250 years ago. So you can measure the history in the atmosphere by drilling ice cores. You've done it in Greenland and in Antarctica. And you can go back 100,000 years in Greenland. You can go 800,000 years back in Antarctica. Here's an example. There's a volcanic eruption right here. And you can see how the dust from the volcanic eruption was locked in that particular layer. You just count back the layers to figure out how many years back you were you were looking and you, there's trapped air so you can measure the CO2 and so here's the measured CO2 in the atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. 800,000 years ago at some spot in Antarctica to the present. And in 2008, we were at a little below, we're like 380 right there. In 2019, we're at 410, we just crossed 410 and we're going up by about 30 parts per decade. There's, what, eight decades left in 2100, and then in this century is about eight decades left. So we expect if we're still emitting at the rate we are right now, 30 times 8, 240, we'd go up by 240 more. So we're right here, go up 40 and then 200 more. And our current emissions will be up here at the end of the century, but we're accelerating. You saw that curve was accelerating. Our emissions are accelerating. So if you take the, how much our emissions are accelerating into account, you kind of expect, based on what we've been doing, that we're going to be up here at 2100. And that will destroy the climate. We can't do this. That's why the IPCC said we've got to cut it back starting now at 10% per year. That's our reality. Hopefully I've shown you enough basic physics and just a tiny little hint of data that you can start to understand it on your own. You don't have to just say, oh, Dr. Hayes says we're in serious trouble. You know why we're in serious trouble, okay? So next week, I'm going to show all the different ways, not all, but many of the different ways that the planet is changing because what, what we're doing, because how we're warming it. We'll see how sea level is rising, how it's accelerating in its rise. We'll see what's happening to all the ice on the planet. We'll see how the ocean's acidifying. We'll see how the increase, a uh, dramatic increase in heavy, heavy uh, rainfall events, uh, increase in heat waves, uh, disruption of the weather, 
how the weather has disrupted very recently. There's been incredible examples of how the weather has become disrupted in the last couple years. So that's next week. And then uh, two weeks from now, I'll show you a bunch of different ideas people have for what we might do. Okay? So we're out of time. Um, if people have questions, people have to leave, probably can leave. People that want to have questions can come and ask me questions, and I'll stay until there's no more questions. If you want to get um, a copy of the transparencies, just come sign up here. Dr. Dolch is taking care of that. And if you're going to get credit for coming to this, sign up there. Thank you for coming.